Torres Strait Islander viewers are advised that the following program contains images and voices of people who have died. Bujiri Gamarua, everyone. Hello, my name is Craig Madden. I'm a proud Bunjalung Gadigal man from the Eora Nation. I'm here today at the University of Sydney on Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. Jinyura Gadigal, this land, this place is Gadigal. It's customary for Aboriginal people to invite guests or visitors onto our land or country. It's a custom that we've been doing for thousands of years. So as a representative of the Metropolitan Aboriginal Land Council and a proud Gadigal man, I'd like to welcome you all onto Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. I'd like to pay my respects to our elders, past, present and emerging. To any visitors from any other nations or any countries, welcome to Gadigal land. To all our Aboriginal brothers and sisters here today, a warm and sincere welcome to Gadigal land. To our non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters here today, a warm and sincere welcome also to Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. The Gadigal clan is one of 29 clans which make up the Eora Nation. It's a nation that's bound by three distinct landmarks. So we have the Hawkesbury River to the north, the Nepean River to the west, and the Georges River down to the south. Within the boundaries of those mighty rivers lie the Eora Nation, and the land that we stand on of the Gadigal people, one of the 29 clans of that nation. So on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council members and our Gadigal mob, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Firstly, let me thank Craig for that very warm welcome to country, and I would like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Welcome everyone to this very special 20th anniversary celebration of the life and work of one of our most impactful alumni, Charles Perkins. It, isn't, it is very fitting that this event is taking place in the 2020 NADOC week. I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to the Perkins family and to Pat Turner, Auntie Pat Turner, who we're very much looking forward to hearing from this evening. Even though we can't all be together this evening, it is wonderful that some of us are able to be here in the heart of our university in our Great Hall. And we are very, very pleased that so many are joining us for our broadcast. As Australia's first university, the University of Sydney is dedicated to shaping change that improves the lives of the local, national and international communities that we serve. In, these three, in the next three decades, it will be 200 years since our founders first conceived the idea of a university on Gadigal land. By 2050, our nation and our university will have changed entirely. Our growing cohort of First Nation students will be graduating to become future leaders, inspired by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander alumni who will surely be government ministers, chief scientists, high court judges and senior diplomats. As a contribution to the community, it is our responsibility to answer the question of how we collectively embed an Indigenous voice in all our teaching and research, and how we ensure the best possible experience for our Indigenous students and staff. This evening marks the last time we will be, enjoy we will be joined by our current Vice-Chancellor, Dr. Michael Spence. Michael is leaving us to take up a new role at the University College London. And we are going to miss him very much. He has been a tireless advocate for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representation at the University of Sydney. A little earlier this year, Michael wrote a discussion paper on what it means to be an Australian university. His words are worth repeating now. If we are to be a university of and for this country, and not merely an international university located here for convenience, he wrote, we must know what it is to live and work alongside the First Nation communities that have been inhabiting this place for 60,000 years. 
Tonight, listening to Auntie Pat, we will learn more of that story. And now, let me welcome to the stage our MCs for the evening, Stan Grant and Isabella Higgins. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Chancellor. Thanks so much for everyone else to be part of this tonight. I'm really pleased to be here for this event, to join you all here in the Great Hall this evening. Thanks as well to Craig Madden. Um, fantastic welcome to country. And uh, we can acknowledge as well that incredible passing on of tradition from your father, Charles Chicka Madden, to yourself tonight. And it's timely as well that we celebrate the last 20 years of this event and look forward to the next 20 and beyond. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to join you for this incredible event, to remember someone who was important in my life and someone who was important to our entire country. And the ABC is proud to be the host broadcaster of the University of Sydney's 20th anniversary of the Dr. Charles Perkins oration. Well, good evening, Stan, and happy NAIDOC week to everyone. It's such a pleasure to join you here tonight at the University of Sydney's Great Hall. And in 2001, the University of Sydney, in collaboration with the Koori Centre, launched the Dr. Charles Perkins oration. The last 20 years, it's been delivered annually by a leading spokesperson within the field of Indigenous and non-Indigenous race relations. The Perkins family continue to support and drive this event. It's an acknowledgement of Dr. Charles Perkins' tireless dedication to human rights and social justice for Indigenous Australians. Well, Charles Perkins' life and legacy has also been acknowledged in song by renowned Australian musician Paul Kelly. And Paul invited us into his studio to film this performance for tonight's event. I was born in the bush near old Alice Springs As far as you get from the sea my mother was a fighter, my daddy was too He never knew a bastard like me My brothers and sisters were scattered like the wind From the desert and the hills to the sea Much too young, many died, but I have survived So lucky, a bastard like me So lucky, a bastard like me I have survived a hell of a ride Nobody knows a bastard like me Call me a stray or a dog every day Call me a mongrel half-free Mongrels are strong, so if you take me on Watch out for a bastard like me Better watch out for a bastard like me I've fought all the way And I fight every day We'll try and stop a bastard like me I've taken my kicks I am a man of degree I wear the scars I earn them so hard Every day in the lucky country Ooh, Every day in the lucky country I've taken my licks And I've kicked against the pricks Try and stop a bastard like me. A lot of people think that Charlie Perkins was a politician, but actually he was a public servant. But he had this extraordinary way of combining activism and public service into the one. He was born in about 1937 at a place called the Bungalow in Alice Springs. It was set up as a humanitarian 
place to basically protect Indigenous children, but it ended up being a place where they were abused and a, very much a, a sort of an apartheid condition. Dad used to go up and sit up on the hills and he'd look out, he could see the town of Alice Springs from the hill and he used to wonder why he couldn't go into the town. So from a very young age he saw this inequality and it like burned inside him and he wanted to change things. That's why he went to the University of Sydney because he felt like he needed the language of the power brokers to be able to talk to them in their own language to change things. And so Dad and a couple of other university students, people like Jim Spiegelman, got together and formed this group called the Student Action for Aborigines Association. And they decided to get this, what started as a research trip to look at the conditions of indigenous people in New South Wales. There were cinemas that were segregated, hospitals were segregated, pools were segregated, pubs were segregated, and they named it after the American Freedom Ride. The Freedom Ride really took events about the plight of Aboriginal people to the national platform for the very first time. Of course, Charles Perkins being one of the two Indigenous people on that Freedom Ride was sort of catapulted into the spotlight. After the 1967 referendum, the Commonwealth took power over Indigenous affairs and Dad decided to move to Canberra because that's where he knew the decisions were going to be made about blackfellas. So I was born in Canberra as a result of that. Aboriginal organisations flourished under his leadership because he believed fundamentally in the principle of self-determination and the oration is one of those opportunities to hear directly from Indigenous leadership about their vision for the future. So it is unique in that way that it is exclusively Indigenous orators, except I should say where Jim Spiegelman, who was a fellow student with Dad and on the Freedom Ride, he participated in the oration that year. This year is the 20th year of the oration and it's a very special year because of the person giving the oration and that is Pat Turner. Pat's leadership has ushered in a change in the way that government is going to do business with Indigenous people. It's an extraordinary thing to be able to sit and listen to these people who are, you know, are walking the talk and are at the front line of, you know, making change in Australia. And that's certainly Dad's legacy. Well, as you heard there from Rachel, in 1966, Charles Perkins was one of the first Aboriginal university graduates in Australia. His legacy continues to inspire and support Indigenous Australians in university education. I'm and I'm from Bardo Island. I'm also Arganman from my dad's side. My name is Sarah Blackwell. I'm a proud Wiradjuri woman. I'm Thomas Harrington. I grew up in Western Sydney on Dara country. I have ancestry from northern New South Wales on Bunjalung country. I'm Tilly Langford. I'm from Mollymook on the south coast. My family is Gumbanga up from Coffs Harbour. I'm studying occupational therapy. I'm studying a Bachelor of Science and Doctor of Medicine. I'm studying a Bachelor of Science and Doctor of Medicine. I'm studying Arts Law at the University of Sydney, majoring in Politics and I I am in my second year. The legacy of Charles Perkins gave me the ability to really do look at education in a way of applying my traditional knowledge and also the education knowledge we learn here to really look down that lens and excel within education. I remember learning about Charlie Perkins in high school and I remember thinking, oh look, that's, that's me, you know, that's someone that I can relate to. He started the Freedom Rides, he was one of the first Indigenous people to graduate from a, a university and I'm not very good at sports so all the sporting stars weren't really my cup of tea but seeing someone like me at university kind of let me realise that I could, I could be that be that person too. The legacy of Charles Perkins has had a significant impact on me personally. I first learned about Charles Perkins in Year 10 history and through his legacy it made me pursue tertiary education at the University of Sydney in particular. During high school I had an amazing Aboriginal Studies teacher who also went to the University of Sydney and she made sure that all of her students celebrated the legacy of Charles Perkins. When I came to the university myself I was absolutely amazed when I saw the building that was named after him because it upheld this really important legacy. Through my work with the university, I was able to travel to Moree last year, where I got to speak to Aboriginal high school students about what university could mean for them. I'm looking to go towards the application of my degree into the remote communities within Australia. I'm planning to go into women's health, specifically Indigenous 
women's health. I feel like we are underrepresented in the community and someone that needs to be there to empower us. Once I finish my studies, I hope to use my degree to travel all across Australia and even internationally, providing medical aid for those who need it most. After I graduate, I hope to enact constitutional recognition for Aboriginal people through the work of the Uluru Statement. I also hope to maybe become a politician, perhaps even Minister for Indigenous Affairs, and create some much needed change for Aboriginal people across Australia. Well, today the University of Sydney awards the annual Dr Charles Perkins Prize to three Indigenous Australian students. In their final year of a Bachelor of Honours degree, these students have all demonstrated outstanding competence during their studies. Please welcome Dr Michael Spence, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sydney, to award this year's Dr Charles Perkins Prize. Thank you, and thank you, Craig, for your welcome to country. I have to say, I was born on Gamaragal land, and it's the bushland around the Langcove River that makes my heart sing. But I am privileged to be working on Gadigal land, and so I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Well, this is an incredibly significant event. It's a significant event for me because it's the last of these Charles Perkins events that I'll be participating in as Vice-Chancellor. And it's a significant event for the university as the 20th Charles Perkins oration. But in a sense, every one of these has been significant because it gives us an opportunity to take stock, to ask the question, how far have we come since those days of the Freedom Rides? And how far do we have to go? And more than that, how far have we come from last year and how far have we got to go next year? And we ask that question of ourselves as a university, and we ask that question too of our nation. Because you'd have to say that if you looked at the record over the last 20 years, there's been moments of great hope, moments where at the Charles Perkins oration, we were sure that things were just gonna change around the corner. And yet, then also moments when promises have been broken or quietly forgotten. Moments too when there have been setbacks of one kind or another in the struggle for healing in this country. Moments when as a country, healing though we may want, we just couldn't help picking at the scabs. And if there's a quality that I really admire in Charles Perkins as an alumnus of the University of Sydney. It's a quality that in a sense he shares with indigenous culture. What extraordinary resilience and power there is in indigenous culture. Try to wipe that face of the uh, uh, culture off the face of the earth and 200 years later it is still powerful and strong. And what Dr. Perkins taught us amongst the many things that he did was that keeping on going, committing again and again and again and again to change and to healing, that's got to be the task of every Australian institution of every Australian. The Chancellor has already said for us, this is an identity issue. It's an identity issue as we struggle to know what it means to be an Australian university. But it's also an identity issue because the kind of graduates that we hope walk through these doors from graduation ceremonies are people who will never give up working for the good. Never give up working until this land is really a partnership between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. It's a great event, the Charles Perkins Centre. I have been so proud to be, the, the Charles Perkins Oration. I've been so proud to be a part of it and so proud to work with the Perkins family on the event during my time as Vice-Chancellor. And I charge you as a group never to let this institution forget the importance of the Perkins dream. And the hope 
is, if you like, that we have extraordinary students, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, extraordinary students of the kind that were on the Freedom Ride. And so the annual Charles Perkins Prize is awarded to the top three Indigenous students at the university and is based on their academic results. This year we've got three exceptional winners who've achieved the highest results in their fields. Their disciplines span arts and performance, a Masters of Music, um, a PhD in research history, particularly with um, respect to Aboriginal land rights. Each winner is awarded a $4,000 prize, and the prize is made possible through the Charlie Perkins Scholarships Trust and through our Indigenous Strategy and Services portfolio. And so I'd like to invite the Chancellor onto the stage to present the award. The first award, which is going to be accepted by um, Bernadette Lennon on behalf of Hayden, is an award for his work, finishing with first class honours and as an advocate for his community. He's now a PhD student at the university. So if Bernadette could come and accept the prize. The second prize is awarded to Katerina Bampus, who is doing a PhD in history, looking at Crown land laws in New South Wales in 1861, and how Crown land was used by the government to secure financial products such as debentures to raise revenues and loans, and the factors that led to Crown land being privatised en masse in 1861 to repay debts, the implications of that in particular for Aboriginal people. as the father of a harpist, I am particularly pleased that the next prize is to Kayla Phillips, who is studying for a Master of Music in Performance at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, and who is an aspiring professional harpist and harp teacher. She completed her Bachelor of Music Performance last year and says the role that music plays in identity and freedom is an incredibly powerful one. Well, thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor, and congratulations to this year's Dr. Charles Perkins Prize recipients. A well-deserved mm -hmm. acknowledgement of all of your hard work. Fantastic. Well done, everyone. And now for an auditory extravaganza. I'd like to welcome to the stage members of the Bararago Choir, hosted by the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. This cross-cultural uh, bring choir brings together the first people of Sydney and non-Indigenous members of the University of Sydney community to share in stories through song. And the song they're going to perform tonight is called Ilalu, which is a Gamilaray word that means a long time ago, and it also means a long time ahead. So please enjoy this performance from the Baregal Choir.
And thank you to the Borrego Choir. It's a fantastic performance. And that theme of a long time ago and a long time ahead resonates with the themes in past orations. Since its inception, the two, since 2001, Indigenous Australian leaders have been invited to deliver the Dr Charles Perkin oration. Recently, we asked some of those leaders how it felt to speak at this event and the lasting change that they achieved through self-determination. In 2014, I delivered the Charles Perkin oration. I explored how self-determination has been a long struggle, a long fight, and that there has been continued resistance by governments and political leaders, institutions and systems to even believe in the thought of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people having the right and the ability to make decisions about our lives and the matters that impact us. In my oration, I focused on human rights and particularly how those human rights related to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It was such a, a privilege to see that the parliament actually formed a parliamentary committee of uh, human rights scrutiny of legislation in 2011. Now, they were outcomes of the speech and so don't think that your voice cannot be heard. I did the Charles Perkin oration in 2018. It was called truth-telling, as relevant then as it is today. Australia hasn't been good at owning its truth. Truth liberates a nation, and the story of First Peoples in this country has to be told truthfully. I spoke in 2013, and it was regarding youth and uh, issues around youth in our area. The strength-based lens is really important for our young ones to see. We cannot keep looking through a deficit lens and expect good results. Charlie believed in solutions and he believed that blackfellas had to design them themselves. We came from, I guess, the bottom of the barrel, which we took responsibility for, and we changed it and became the solution as a people ourselves in a local community where no one expected it. The year was 2016 when I delivered the Charlie Perkins oration at the University of Sydney. Everything I spoke about in 2016, we still speak about in 2020. And uh, my concern is that we're still going to speak about it in 2050, but we shouldn't. And I spoke about the urgency then and I still speak about the urgency now. It was an incredible honour to be asked by the Perkins family to be one of the interviewers on stage uh, at the 2016 oration. The thing that resonated with me the most was Malandiri McCarthy when she was talking about a personal memory she had of Charles Perkins. And one of the things Charles Perkins said to her was, regardless of all the good things that happened to you in your life, never, never leave, leave anyone, anyone behind. behind. And uh, that really resonated with me, still resonates with me, and uh, it resonated very strongly with the audience. Well, this event has been resonating with audience for two decades now. And tonight, this event is being live streamed to the ABC Indigenous Facebook, and we invite you to post your questions about the oration in the comments under the stream. Well, the person who will be delivering the 2020 Dr Charles Perkins oration is the indomitable Auntie Pat Turner. Auntie Pat is a proud Gurundji woman and Aranda woman and the Chief Executive Officer of the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation. She is also the convener of the Coalition of Peaks and the co-chair of the Joint Council on Closing the Gap. So please welcome Auntie Pat Turner to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Urta. Hello, my name is Pat Turner. I am very honoured to deliver this year's Charles Perkins oration. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, the traditional owners and custodians of this land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I especially acknowledge Uncle Chika and Aunty Lily and thank you, Craig, for your welcome, but Ch uh, Chika and Lily are family also, and it's lovely to have you here tonight. 
I extend my warmest regards to his daughters, Uncle Charlie's daughters, not this Charlie, Charlie Burkett's, Hetty, Rachel and his son Adam. Hetty, Rachel and Adam and their kids are watching tonight from Charlie's birth and resting place at the bungalow in Alice Springs. Their mother and Charlie's wife, Auntie Eileen, is here with me tonight. I thank Auntie Eileen for her support over many years. Charlie was my uncle, my father's brother, but we didn't talk about each other like that as niece and uncle. We were just family. I acknowledge, I acknowledge uh, Chancellor Belinda Hutchinson, AC, Vice Chancellor Principal and Principal, Dr. Michael Spence, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Lisa Jackson Pulver, the Perkins family, the Metropolitan Aboriginal Land, Local Land Council, and the combination of staff from the University of Sydney and the Australian Broadcasting Corporation who have worked so hard to bring together this event tonight. I have titled Charlie's, uh, I have char titled this oration, Charlie's Lessons and Legacy. So let me now move to Charlie's influence. Charlie is much is as much an inspiration to me now as he was when I was a kid. I remember when he would come home to Alice Springs and tell stories of the fight for the civil rights of Aboriginal people. Charlie would be talking to us under the shade of a tree outside Nana's house about his latest battles. A child of 12, I would be hanging her back a bit. I can't get too close to the adults, but I was close enough to take in every of Charlie's words and take in as much as I could in terms of what he was saying. I was in awe and I was proud. In awe, as Charlie was taking on the country taking on the fight for equality for our people in a way and on a scale that had not been seen before. And proud that being a part of Charlie's family, I was already a part of the story of change. In his stories, Charlie would set out what he saw as the difficulties Aboriginal people face today and tomorrow. He set out those difficulties with courage and fire to imagine a better world despite them. And it was under that tree that he talked through the cultural, legal and moral changes that needed to take place in Australia and the courage required in order for us to create a better world. It is Charlie's courage and the fire that he had in his belly that has guided many of the decisions in my life and career and continues to light much of my path today. To the nation, Charlie is remembered as a man who dedicated his life to achieving justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, a renowned activist and fearless spokesperson. To me, Charlie will always be the man who came home to Alice Springs and talked to us under the shade of the tree. Holding a mirror to our nation. Whilst Charlie's achievements are too numerous to recount in detail tonight, His life does provide 
many lessons for us trying to follow in his footsteps. An early lesson that stands out is the need to mobilise the media, to tell stories of hope to, for our own people and to call out the nation for its appalling treatment of First Nations peoples. Following his death in the October 2000, I delivered his eulogy to an overflowing Sydney Town Hall. In that tribute, I spoke from the heart and my head when I observed that Charlie held a mirror in front of this country and exposed the discrimination and racism of our people that our people endured. Charlie knew that for Australia to face up to the plight of my, our people, that they had to be shown what was already right there in front of them. This desire led to both the formation of the Student Action for Aborigines group and the decision to organise a bus tour in, to, of Western New South Wales towns. His role in instigating the Freedom Ride in 1965 changed mindsets in mainstream Australia. The Freedom Ride showed the nation the poor state of Aboriginal health, education and housing. But through the media, Charlie and his comrades also highlighted discriminatory barriers which existed between Aboriginal and white residents. Through the effective use of television, Charlie managed to get a national audience to face up, to turn the mirror on our nation. Challenging the consciousness of Australia through the Freedom Ride made Charlie the early spokesperson for our people and to many non-Indigenous people, a mischief maker. Not that he was ever too fussed about what white Australians thought of him, except of course his wife, who we all love. But Charlie was always working to mobilise our own people. He wanted Aboriginal people to see what we deserved more, that we deserved more, should demand more and could be more. As Charlie said, the Freedom Ride was not for the white people, but to tell Aboriginal people that they didn't have to be, the, to be second class. He said, quote, I wanted to say, don't cop shit when you don't have to. And I think they listened. Charlie would reflect to me later how important the media was in changing our nation's treatment of our people. But the trick, he said, was to make sure you were in and challenging today's news but not to do it in such a way that meant you were tomorrow's fish and chips wrapping. Knowing the systems you are seeking to change. Perhaps Charlie's greatest lesson for us, though, is the need to know and understand and be part of systems you want to challenge and change. If we look back at each of the major developments in Indigenous affairs policy since the 1960s, Charlie was always there. He was there because he knew how to change and influence policy. Charlie understood that achieving equality for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people required more than governments just providing funding for housing, health and 
essential services and employment and education of our people, important as this is. He understood that a solution was also required to the structural problem caused by our people being excluded from the colonial institutions established to govern Australia. Charlie knew, too, that it was vital that Aboriginal people had to be fully involved in running Aboriginal affairs. To do so, and to do so well. Charlie first set out to study and learn about the system he wanted to change. Here, at university, Charlie chose to study political science because in his words, he wanted to investigate the institutions of government, how they operate, who operates them, and how you can run an Aboriginal organisation as a pressure group. Charlie instilled this lesson in me at an early age. I had caught the train from Alice Springs with Nana Hetty to watch Charlie graduate in 1966. As I stood here on the grounds of the University of Sydney, watching Charlie, I knew I had to pursue my own education for the same purpose. Charlie knew that to truly challenge the deeply ingrained ways of bureaucracy and to make the system that was designed and intended for our people's benefit to truly work for our benefit, he had to do it from the inside of government. So Charlie was not just an advocate, advocate who wrote speeches, who wrote articles and carried flags at rallies. He chose to engage with governments directly, to step inside the tent. In doing so, he became the first Aboriginal person to head an Australian government department. Charlie saw being in government inside the tent as a means of uh, being able to channel funding directly to our communities and to influence policy at the highest levels of decision making. And he encouraged me to pursue that same objective. Like Charlie, I too have spent a great deal of my career inside government. Drawing on his lessons, I used much of this time to observe, campaign, take opportunities for our people where I could, and to make decisions that were going to help our people, and also how we could secure political influence to support programs that were directly for the benefit of our people. Taking real control. While Charlie believed in the importance of change from within, he also teaches us the lesson of Aboriginal control. True Aboriginal control where we are exercising our political agency as Aboriginal people over our own affairs, designing and delivering our own programs without the constraints of government. During Charlie's life, he oversaw the establishment of many Aboriginal controlled and run organisations designed to deliver the services we needed on our own terms. 
It is here where I am now dedicating my time and where I see the most potential for our people. Like Charlie, I realised that there was a limit to what could be achieved for our people inside government. In government, we are always working in a system that is not ours. One that is designed to serve a purpose that is beyond Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander interests alone. Aboriginal community control is an act of self-determination for our people. It is how we exercise greater political agency within the present policy landscape. Currently, there is no other way of delivering and governing services or providing us with a say in policy and programs that guarantees Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander empowerment and protects our identity and culture for the long term. There is strong evidence that community controlled services are better for our people, achieve better results and help make, and help make sure we get the support we need. Community controlled organisations employ more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people than mainstream organisations and results in communities taking more responsibility for services. Through their involvement in policy and political advocacy, our organisations also provide a voice for First Nations peoples. Without them, the accountability of governments would be far weaker. Whilst I believe that our community controlled organisations are the best form of agency for our people, a relationship with government that is responsive to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is still required. This is a recognition that we have a shared future. Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians together. And that the two must come together to deliver lasting equality and recognition for First Nations peoples. Inside and outside the tent. The lessons I learned from being inside government and the lessons and importance of Aboriginal community control, Charlie's lessons, are being brought to bear in a new partnership between the Coalition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Community Controlled Peak Organisations and all Australian governments. The Coalition of Peaks are made up of nearly 50, 55 in fact, national and state and territory community controlled peak organisations. We formed as an act of self-determination and came together to be formal partners with all Australian governments on closing the gap. Their headline policy about achieving equality for our people. All our leaders who have been sitting at the negotiating table with governments have either been elected to the boards of our organisations by members of the communities that they come from or have been appointed by boards as CEOs of their organisations. We have worked with our communities for decades on matters that are important to our people 
in, in the areas of health, early childhood, disability, education, land rights, legal services, you name it, we do it. The Coalition of Peaks have brought our own political agency to the table through a negotiated formal arrangement with governments which have agreed a new national agreement on closing the gap. It is the first time that our peaks have come together in this way and it is the first time an intergovernmental national agreement designed to improve outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people has been developed and negotiated between our representatives and government. The first time, 2020. As long as we're a resilient people, I guess, and a very patient people. But you can understand the frustration that we feel. The national agreement commits this country to a new way of working between governments and First Nations peoples. It is a new way of working that is based on negotiation and shared decision making. But it is early days and the months and the years ahead will be testing times. For the Coalition of Peaks, we need to continually strengthen our own governance and stay connected with our communities while at the same time working to keep ahead of the game to stay in front of Australian governments with their vast num uh, numbers of resources. Governments will also need to demonstrate that their institutions and bureaucracies can embrace the change and reform to meet the challenges and commitments set out in the national agreement. Lasting change can only come when it is embedded in the culture of organisations. And as we know, traditionally, Australian governments are slow to adapt. The matter of much needed funding and new funding for services and supports for our peoples remains an issue that is yet to be fully addressed by governments. What is different now, though, is that we at least have a seat at the negotiating table on an equal basis with governments. We believe, ultimately, a partnership between community-controlled organisations and governments will achieve better outcomes for our people, where we are both inside and outside of the tent. I strongly believe Charlie would have been very proud of what we have achieved in the new national agreement on closing the gap. He would have thought it wasn't achievable when he was still here. He would be glad that we've done it now. In the meantime, even if the national agreement fulfills its promise, the picture of reform is far from complete. As First Nations peoples, we need a, a voice to the Commonwealth Parliament to monitor and advise on making laws with respect to our people because that is still missing from the political and the policy landscape. So too is truth-telling and treaties. Standing up for what is right. The new partnership with governments and the work of the Coalition of Peaks has not come without its criticism, including from our own people. So the last lesson from Charlie's life I want to share with you today 
is to stand up for what you believe is right and to seize the opportunities you have. It is probably the hardest lesson to practice from Charlie's life. From an early age, Charlie was prepared to stand up for what he believed in, what he thought was right. Over the course of his life, he never backed down. Charlie's life led to great gains for our people. In speaking out, his life was not just for himself and his family, but for our people and ultimately for Australia. Charlie's approach to life must continue to inspire us all to more unified and purposeful action. Action where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are collectively taking back control of our own affairs. As we reflect on the legacy, the lessons and the legacy of Charlie's life, of his courage, the fire in his belly, he lit in so many of us, I leave with you his own words. He said, I am here today, gone tomorrow, and I have only played a small role like other Aboriginal leaders. Like other Aboriginal leaders do. But we're only passing, you know, like ships in the night, really. And where the answer is, is with the mass of Aboriginal people, not with the individuals. Thank you. Okay. I'm okay. not done with you yet. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. It's a wonderful, um, a wonderful oration. Thank you so much, Artie Patton. I know that um, that Uncle Charlie would have been watching and yeah. watching on, and 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 really proud. And it's not the um, the first time you've been in this great hall, is it? Um, tell us about last time you were here. For the graduation, I think. Um, in the in here. Mm. Um, was it in this place? Yeah. And uh, I remember the building. I, you know, don't forget, I was only 13. <laughs> <laughs> but, that was but, a long time ago. But, but look what it led to, and look I what know. it inspired in you. Absolutely. But he, he inspired me before he, he graduated, of course. Uh, you know, he was, uh, he was such a... Uh, he had such a presence. And he was so smart and quick-witted. And he loved country music, like I do. <laughs> well, I didn't... Adam didn't, though. His son didn't. <laughs> Did not like country music. Adam got kicked out of the car once. <laughs> Sorry. Well, Sorry, Adam. Well, I don't know whether um, Uncle Charles Perkins would like social media, but social media is liking you and Uncle Charlie, saying how much they've appreciated and how much you inspire them. But can you tell us a little bit about what it means to be here at Sydney Uni to giving this very special oration? It means the world to me, you know. I was so happy when Hetty rang me and said the family would like you to do the oration this year. I was thinking, well, it's about bloody time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I, I'm glad it's the 20th, and I'm glad I did it before you leave, Michael. <laughs> I mean, it's going to London, poor bugger, you know, to COVID. So stay COVID safe and, and fly our flag high in London, and, and all my very best to you and your family. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you so Thank much. You.
All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ani Pat. Thank you to everyone who joined us in the comments on the ABC Indigenous Facebook page. And thank you so much as well for joining us for the Dr. Charles Perkins Oration 20th anniversary. It's been an honour to be here and to host this event as well. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more, Stan. It's been a real honour. And to complete the evening, please welcome Sydney's own tribal warrior performers. Thank you.